Hello. My name is Tucker Johnson, and I am your host today, as we are all going to be experiencing a NIMSY Live, where we talk about the latest and greatest localization, internationalization, translation, culturalization, and all that fun stuff that global companies need to delight their international customers, or at least to not piss them off too much. On this program, we invite guests who like to have fun and have some value to add. I'm always looking for a good guest, a good data set, a good presentation. So if there are any topics out there or any guests that you'd like to see on the program for future episodes, please let me know and we will reach out to that. We have producers now. We have people that manage such things. So that's kind of a fun thing. Kind of a fun thing. If you're not already subscribed, make sure that you're subscribing to Nimsy Insights. Uh, we're going to you live today on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, a bunch of other stuff. So your social media platform of choice, pick it, subscribe to Nimsy Insights, and you'll be the first to be notified when we go live in the future. Now, you may notice that there's 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 some different stuff going on here in the background. And that's because we've changed studios. So I'm really hoping that you guys can all hear me. I'm, I'm assuming that this microphone is working. I'm assuming that all of the cords are plugged into the right places. And if you can't, um, if you can't hear me, then come on over into chat and let me know. And um, we'll be checking that chat periodically. I'll bring it up on, on screen here um, in the big mode here. Hello from Mexico City, somebody says. And I didn't see that other one. That's... That's quite all right. So uh, what are we going to plug today? We're going to plug NIMSY Research because I have just been doing some more research myself for NIMSY. It's been a long time since I've written anything, but I've been working on a couple of research projects personally. And if you haven't done so already, make sure that you go over to NIMSY.com and check out uh, NIMSY.com forward slash research and check out all of the latest localization research that we have out there available. And anything else I want to plug? I don't think so. I think we can just go ahead and get started here. I will bring up my guest here, Avi Stamen. How badly did I mispronounce your name, sir? You, you got it perfect on the first shot. So nice. don't, don't sell yourself short. <laughs> nice. I am going to shorten myself a little bit, though, to, to be the same height as you here. Um, well, welcome to the show. You are an expert in academic localization and translation. Is that correct? Tell, tell us about yourself. Yeah, thanks. So, first of all, Tucker, thanks so much for having me on. Um, you know, you, uh, you mentioned that you like to have interesting and uh, intelligent people on. I'll try to be interesting. I can't promise about intelligence, but uh, <laughs> I'll well, share here. a little bit about my my dark corner of the industry, um, which I, I feel very you know passionate about, uh, but maybe isn't as well known uh, to to some of your listeners. And shed a little bit of light on this industry uh, called academic translation. So we kind of sit at a crossroads. Um, you've got you know sort of the translation and the LSP uh, world. And then you've got academic research and academic publication. And those two worlds cross quite often because scholars from around the world are trying to publish their research. That's sort of the currency in academia. If you can manage to publish your research in a reputable journal, so all of a sudden what you're saying has validity, it has um, substance. Um, you know, so for example, during the pandemic, if you wanted to, you know, push your uh, vaccine, you had to do the trials and the studies and the checks, but then you had to publish your research. And for many scholars for whom English is not their native tongue, uh -huh. that's not so necessarily something that comes naturally or that they can do on their own. And therefore they need, uh, you know, assistance such as, you know, what, what the, 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 you know, services that we're providing in order to really help them accomplish their goal, which is publishing their research. And so why can't they just use Google Translate? Oh, that's a re <laughs> that's a really good question. I hope I, I, I you know, as a uh, everyone who's tuning in here, I'm sure knows the the strengths and weaknesses of Google yeah, yeah. Translate. But I do get that question quite often, or you know, when it comes and, and to that, and that's why I ask, of course, of course, right? Of it's course. not a, it's not a serious question for serious localization professionals, but it, it's it's a valid question because there's for people sure. out and, there and, that need to know. Yeah, and we and we and we get scholars who will try to save some money by throwing what they have into Google Translate and then paying us to edit instead of translating. Um, 
And uh, we generally turn around to them and tell them, uh, you know, thank you, but no, thank you. Yeah. Um, essentially, so there's two there's two things that I would say that are unique about academia. First of all, is the level of repeatability, right? Which is what a lot of these um, AI solutions are based on, um, is actually quite low, and that's very purposeful in the sense that when you're working on research, you have to come up with a novel idea. If you're regurgitating ideas that have already been communicated previously, so you're not really bringing anything new to the table. So it, it's so, actually really So there's no important. engines really trained for that. Exactly. All Meaning right. the level of, the, there's no mass, ma the, the machines can't learn from a mass quantity of data because everyone needs to be you um, new and unique. In fact, I, it goes it's, a step further. If, if you're researching stuff where there's already a mass quantity of data, pick something else to research. <laughs> is exactly. what you're saying, right? You're probably in the wrong field. And I'll tell you more than that. If more than 10% of your paper, or you know, there are different 10%, 15% of your paper is repeated from previous works, you actually will be caught on plagiarism, and you won't get, and you'll, you could, your reputation could be harmed. So not only is there sort of an incentive, but there's, there's a carrot and the stick to why you don't want to repeat um, what it is that you're doing. So that's sort of one, you know, the first reason why I would say that, you know, really Google or any other, um, you know, machine translation is not really viable. The second um, point, which I think is really important, is in many ways in academia, there's a somewhat of a similarity to literature in that medium is part of the message. So the beauty and, 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 and level of expression and communication and the human creativity that goes into rendering um, the, the, the expression can actually make an impact on whether an article is accepted or rejected. So it's not, it, it, it's, a, it's about the narrative and it's about how you express and communicate the research as much as it is about the findings itself. Now, there are differences, I wanna be clear, there are differences between you know, very technical engineering fields where you know, really just pop out the data and do it in a semi-understandable way and you probably can get away with it. Um, as opposed to let's say literature where, you know, or, or history where the, where how I communicate, how I speak, how I, how I talk is really quite critical to message itself. But I'll tell you, I'll take one more thing, which I think is really important to understand here. Um, this is a really competitive industry. And what I mean by that is, is that on average, somewhere between 80 to 90% of submissions um, to academic journals are rejected. Okay. So, so let's just take a step back and think about the process. A researcher, spends two or three years, you know, studying whatever it is that's important to them to study. Um, they've, you know, dedicated their time, their effort, their sweat and tears. They've built a whole team around it. They've maybe have spent, you know, uh, three to six months writing it up um, and making sure that it's communicated properly. Then they may trans, and then let's say they translate it with us. They finally submit it. The vast majority of the time, they're not going to get accepted. So every little um, competitive advantage that you can get as a researcher um, to make your research stands out can really make the difference between acceptance, acceptance and rejection. And that directly has a correlation with career advancement and career um, success. So there's a lot riding on this. Someone once told me, you know, the amount that someone's going to be willing to spend on a translation is relative to what they have to lose if it goes wrong. And in our case, there's a lot to gain if you do it well, and there's a lot to lose if you don't do it well. Or, you know, so, so that's, that's kind of, um, you know, just a little bit of like an intro, I guess I would say into, uh, what, what makes what we're doing a little bit different, a little bit unique. Well, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me because, uh, frankly, academic localization, academic translation, ac ac academic, anything is kind of a foreign thing to me as <laughs> no one's ever accused me of being an academic in my life. <laughs> But um, I, I am very interested to hear that there's almost a sales component to this because when I think of um, like academic literature and publication and, and research and stuff like that, I'm thinking of something that's very dry, something that's not very interesting, something that's very black and white, like there's specific terms that must be used, no, no room for – for error, or no room for for discussion on that. And what you're telling me is, you said that the how did you put it? The context, the method, the delivery mechanism. The medium is the message. The, the medium is the message exactly. So you're telling me that the medium is the message. I never would have thought that for academic translation. So there's there's a component of almost marketing translation to it. Or am, am I yeah. off base on that? So it, it's funny because, you know, sometimes I joke to myself that we have the, 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 best, of both, the best of both worlds, but also the worst of both, of, of, of both worlds. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and explain what I mean. I'll start out by saying that 
Um, I guess Tucker, I, we have this in common. I'm also not a, 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 you know, an academic myself, and that's ironic because most, of, you know, a lot. I get emails on a daily basis saying, "Dear Doctor Stamen," and I appreciate the honorary doctorate that I'm awarded, but I actually don't have a doctorate. Um, and um, and and I, I think in certain ways, obviously, you know, there was a learning curve when I first started, just to understand the academic milieu and understand kind of, kind of what that may, means. But it actually, I think, has served in many ways as, as an advantage as well to be able to kind of have an outsider's perspective and say, you know, you're so deep into your text that you can't see the forest for the trees. You actually need someone else who can come in from the outside and say, OK, I'm a, you know, above average intelligence or just average intelligence reader. I don't know what the hell you're saying. Maybe you need to reconsider how it is that you're structuring it. So you're very right that, uh, Tucker, that that you as an academic transla translator, you really have to honor and respect the source text. You can't just start going off on your own and your, you know, and and inventing things that aren't there. Um, scholars will go over with a fine tooth comb every single word that you use. So in that way, I, I like to say that we have, in some ways, the most pedantic, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 clients maybe of, of of any industry. On the flip side, in the end of the day, the ones, the real decision makers, the real gatekeepers are. The, the individual is called academic reviewers. So what happens is, is that when you submit an academic article, it goes through a peer review process, which means you get two or three of the co colleagues from uh, the author of the article, and they'll look it over and they'll say, this is good, this is not good, here's what you need to fix up, I reject it, I accept it. If they can't under, if they're breaking their head saying, what the hell is this this guy or this gal trying to say, and they can't get to the the actual novelty of the research itself or what you're trying to, you know, then we could miss Einstein's theory of relativity that, because make me think, it, right? It's, yeah, because it's like, you know, it's so convoluted in 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 the text. So it, you know, we we we're we're somewhat anonymous. Our goal is not for people necessarily to say, oh, who's the translator here? But our goal course, is yeah. for people to be able to spend their, I mean, hopefully they do, but our goal is for them to be able to focus on the on the message and not just on, you know, can I decipher what's written here? Right. And I think that's a really important um, component to our work. Well, and that's one thing that we say all the time is that translation is only in the news when it gets screwed up, when there's a mistake, right? And, you know, a good translation should never even be thought of as a translation. So I, I hear that. I, I have some practical questions just to try to understand the space. And then I'm going to go say hi to some people in the comments later. But... Um, <laughs> Just to understand the space, who are your clients? Like a, a new client calls you on the phone or he sends you an email. Who is that and what are they asking for? Yeah, really good question. So there is a – so I'll tell you a little bit. Maybe to answer your question, I'll try to tell you a little bit about the evolution of the company because our our, our clients um, are still the same as they were in day one, but sort of the marketing approach and the, the strategic approach of the company has shifted quite and, uh, and, and, and I don't think I, you know, I, I, I have in my teleprompter here, I have your whole introduction and your company information, but I, you know, I haven't done this for months, so I skipped it. I, I screwed up. But um, did you, did we mention your company name and where we can find, find all of that and stuff? Um, oh yeah. You know, I, this is, this is a mistake I make on every presentation I give. Yeah, I like, get so excited. We're talking I get about so excited company. by the content of what I'm talking about that I totally forget to say, hi, you know, this is my name. This is what I do. You know, <laughs> come check us out. All right. So I appreciate that. Um, yeah. We're uh, the name, uh, the company that I run is Academic Language Experts. Um, we specialize in what are, what the, the, the industry is called author services. Okay. So okay. there is a, we have a slew of services that are intended to help authors to publish their research. So translation is one of the major uh, areas of focus, as you can see here, editing, translation, and publication support for scholars. That's our, our, our you know, byline. Um, but it's not exclusively. There are other things that we do to help with, you know, if a scholar comes to us and wants another fellow scientist to review their work for the from the scientific perspective, we can do that as well. So that's kind of the, um, you know, the, the, the you know, quick uh, summary of, 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 of what we do. Um, where translation has come into play is really from scholars who are not, who need to publish in English because the lingua franca of academia is English. 90% um, of research is published in English, for better or for worse. And, you know, there are differing opinions about whether it's a good thing or not. Um, but we're really trying to help uh, those scholars publish the research. So going back to the beginning, when I first started out, this was totally happened by mistake. Uh, you know, one of my professors, when I was a student, actually still in university, um, was impressed with my English 
um, because I was too lazy to write in the local language. And I said, can I please write in English? And he agreed. And he was impressed with my English. And he said, oh, why don't you go ahead and translate my article for me? And I said, how hard could that be? Meanwhile, like five months later, I was still breaking my teeth over what the hell he was trying to say. But I learned a good lesson that there's a need and that it's not easy. Right. And not anyone can just kind of pick this up and do it. But it's not a hobby. It's really, uh, you know, a, a skill and a profession. So the first, I would say, three, four or five years of our company, and we started back in 2014, we're really dedicated to let's prove out that we've got a business model that works for individual scholars. Um, let's not think too big. Let's just go scholar to scholar and make sure we're really helping people. Are we help? Are we getting successes, success stories? Are we having scholars who are coming back to us and saying, listen, Avi, your services helped me to publish my article. I now got my promotion. I now have a new grant um, because of the article. And like, thank you. That's what I wanted to hear. And that's what we started hearing more and more and more. And about two or three years ago, I made the decision to kind of uh, take a step back as uh, from operations and think about strategic development. And I asked myself, okay, now that we know we can help individual scholars, how do we help institutions? How do we help publishers? And the reason that's important is because, Tucker, I'm sure you've seen this. Um, every year a list comes out of like the top 50, 100 universities in the world. And, you know, yep. UW, you know, tries to compete and get to the top 100 or, you know, and this year they're in and this year they're out and maybe, in, right? It's a, there's a lot of, you know, excitement around that time. And actually, there's a lot of money there. Um, universities are somewhat funded by their rankings. And the rankings are influenced by how many and how and the quality of the publications that come out from that university. So if the university is doing really well with the research that they're publishing, they can actually go up in the rankings and get more funding from, uh, uh, from governments. So what happens is, is that... Um, Uh -oh. Those are partnerships with academic publishers who are actually producing, uh, who are actually publishing the research, and also academic institutions who are trying to, you know, rate, you know, go up the ladder and get their rankings higher, um, and helping them as institutions to improve their research. Um, this also, by the way, there's a big uh, sort of side industry of, of grants. So if you're a scholar and you want to, I don't know, you need new equipment or you need you know, a, a, a research team to help you conduct it, or you wanna build a new lab, so you need to apply for grant funding. That too requires translation and editing help and, and support to put together a strong proposal. So all of these things kind of feed into the core business, which is helping scholars on their journey um, to, where, to where they need to go. So again, the, the, the core service is still helping individual scholars, but the way that the, the focus has shifted for the business is that instead of just going, you know, knocking one door at a time, now we're trying to and, 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 and have been making institutional partnerships so that we can help, you know, all of Harvard, we can help all of Cambridge, you know, with their research. And that's kind of where the scale um, comes in and where we're able to really to kind of scale up and, and really make it into a business with, you know, that has a lot of potential, um, you know, that, that, that is growing currently and has a lot of potential for the future. I'm sorry, I lost my, I was on mute there. I was, I was trying to, no I was trying to interrupt you, but, <laughs> but I couldn't because I'm incompetent at my job. Um, yeah. So it, interesting. So the, the translation follows the money essentially is, is kind of what I'm hearing a little bit because I'm hearing a lot about grants and proposals and promotions and um, stuff like that. So essentially the, the business, there, there's still a business case for it, for, for translation. It's not just, you know, academia um, research, you know, just out there researchers yeah. translating stuff for the good of the world and stuff. There, there is still very much a need for budget on that. Who pays for it though? Like, yeah, we're not, we're yeah, we're not translators without borders. This is not a voluntary, you know, I, so, I, I organization. That's <laughs> probably why I have that conception because I'm most familiar with TWB, right? And so when I think of, you know, translating for research, I think of these nonprofits, I think of these charities, I think of all of these different things. And um, that's not the case. So I'm getting well, an let education. Well, let me reorient to you. Let okay. me reorient you for please, a second. Please. A pharma company, okay that needs to put out a study and needs to localize that study will come to us because we know the, because we have the, you know, the, the, the industry, the, the field 
expertise and specialty knowledge. A pharma company that wants to publish their research in Nature, which is or Cell, which are kind of like the Holy Grail uh-huh. of or the New England Journal of Medicine, which are the Holy Grail of publication, because if they manage to do that, then all of a sudden their product, you know, Love is that. is sort of given the rubber stamp of approval. That is serious, um, you know, that's serious business. And that's not something which is just kind of for the good of humanity. I'm all for the good of humanity. And, and, oh, and no, one yeah. of our main missions is... Humanity's is, rocks. You know, no, don't get me wrong. Yeah, no, one, <laughs> one of our main missions is really to help scholars for whom English is not their native language um, either gain a level playing field or even surpass their Anglo colleagues. Because we really believe that the best research should be put out there. It shouldn't be limited or hampered by the level of expression um, or the fact that you happen to be born in a country where English is not the native language. So there's definitely a market here. We're not the only player in this market, um, but I would say that we've taken translation the most seriously. There are others that, you know, kind of are, you know, if you would Google, um, we don't show up on first page, not yet uh, for editing um, in academic sphere, but we do for translation. We've kind of taken translation as, 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 you know, uh, um, be, trying to be the leaders in that, in that, niche uh within academia and there's so much in in the world that's that's influenced by research and when you think about research in the broadest sense of the term not just i talk i've talked a lot until now and you know about publishing an article in you know a journal but let's think about all the other areas and industries that research touches that are that are related so as soon as we're working with a uh, you know, a doctor on their research. So all of a sudden we get into the hospital and the hospital has a lot of documentation that needs to be translated. All these things, all these things are networks that we're building up um, that bring a lot of business kind of along the way. So I think it's a mistake. You know, one of our biggest clients is trying, is trying to become the biggest university um, in Europe and if not the world, and they're an online university that's teaching um, AI, machine learning, um, you know, engineering. And these are, these are really sought after industries. So I think that it's a bit sort of superficial or, or you know, to, to look at this industry as kind of like, oh, a cute, you know, I don't know, um, add on. It actually in and of itself, in my opinion, is is untapped and has a tremendous amount of potential um, because that's the way the world's going. You want to offer online courses, you're going to need to localize and you're going to need to translate. Yeah. You, you know, you want to make sure your research has an impact, you know, and in, in, in the local population and, and has influence or you know, you're putting together a policy paper as a, as a politician, all of these things require sort of the honed skills that our translators have um, in order to succeed. So I really, I try to define um, research in academia in the broadest possible terms. And I think that every corporation that takes itself seriously has an R and D wing, right? Those, that R and D wing are our customers as well. Okay. So it's, it, That's you know, fair. it's just kind of open it up. A- yeah. As you're talking, it's like, it, I suddenly remembered that I work for Nimsy. Re- well, it's called Nimsy Insights, exactly. but I work for a research company. Like we, we, we brand ourselves as a research and consulting company and first and foremost research. Right. So I don't know why I have this prejudice or this bias, I should say in my head. Um, probably because I'm not listening to your podcast. Tell us about that. Tell us about your YouTube channel that I got pulled up here. And because I'm just looking through this and it kind of tells me some of the stuff you talk about strategic planning for your upcoming research grant, elevating your research's reach and impact, invoicing and payment instructions, crafting a winning book proposal. All sorts of topics on here. So I, yeah. I don't know why I'm trying to pigeonhole you here into. <laughs> something that you're not yeah so so um most of these are from our publication success interview series and these are monthly uh zoom events uh that we do that are open to the public free of charge um no cost whatsoever and my goal i it's really fun i'm, I'm kind of doing what you're doing tucker which is i'm finding what the people i find to be most interesting uh in my industry um and i am speaking with them about uh, about topics relating to publishing. Because in the end of the day, translation is a means to an end, at least in my industry. And I, and, and I you know, the, the marketing, you know, lessons that I've learned are always talk to your clients about how to accomplish their goals. Don't just talk to them about how great you are and what you're doing. So I actually don't necessarily talk too much about translation editing, the language side of things. I talk more about how do you as a researcher accomplish what you're trying to do or as a research institution accomplish. So how do you, how do you win a 2.5 million euro grant? Like we helped someone win back in May, 
Like, how do you do that? You, you right? know what, though? You know what? There's a lot of translation companies, LSPs, language services providers, that should be taking a uh, uh, following your lead, essentially. Um, this is something we tell people all the time here at Nimsy is that stop talking about translation. Like your your clients your clients don't care about translation. What do they care they about? Care. They care about winning that proposal. They were the, or that grant. They care about impressing their end users. They care about all these things. But the more and LSPs are we're they're horrible about this because oh translation is so great and blah 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 because it's our life and nobody cares. Nobody cares. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a secret that I I you know it may get me shot on this. Uh, program oh, i right. started out as a translator myself i find it a bit boring um and 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 that doesn't now i think we're doing amazing work and the people that work for us they love it and they're passionate about it, and that's oh, yeah. what's important and i love God running the business and i love helping scholars achieve their goals and accomplish what they're trying to do so i have no problem talking about I, we can sit here and shoot I, degrees I, about translation I, i'm so I, everything you just said it pretty much applies <laughs> to me right i started out Got as it. a horrible translator and I, I much more enjoy the, I don't know, the, the business, the project management of it, essentially. Yeah. I, I started out as a project manager in this industry because no one would hire I'm because I'm a shitty translator. Um, so <laughs> they, they had to make me a project manager. And um, I say once a project manager, always a project manager. So that's kind of like my world. I like you know moving the chess pieces and stuff like that. Um, don't get me wrong. I love language and linguistics and all of that stuff. But um, I just I don't have a, I don't have the bones for it to be a translator. For I sure. Think. And I have so much respect for the people I do hire because they're so much better than I. And it actually makes my my life much easier because when I get calls from clients saying, well, what would you do in this paragraph? I say, whoa, 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 wait up. Right. Um, you don't want to talk to me. You want to talk to the real experts who are the members of my team. Um, but um, but, you know, that, and, that, and that kind of really, um, you know, so so. I, I think it's really important just to understand, you know, if we are talking within the industry, um, that, you know, you really have to do a deep dive into what are the real deep needs of um, uh, of your clients. Ask and what questions. we realized yeah. is, what we, we really realized is, and I'm sure there's always more to learn, um, is that our scholars, they, they're not doing it for the money, um, even though there is money in, in research. They're not, you know, being paid necessarily the big bucks or sometimes they're not even being paid the same as if they went out to industry. Um, but they care deeply and they want to leave their mark. They want to leave their lasting impression. They want to leave their legacy that they did something to, you know, bring something new to the world or, or, or change the world. And is the funding limitless? No, it's not Fortune 500. But do scholars have research budgets that they have to use every year, um, which you know, go to these sort of things 100% because like we said before, a university that's not supporting their scholars properly is going to start tanking. Um, and that means their enrollment is going to go down. And that means their funding is going to go down. So it's not, you know, there's a lot at stake um, in this field and in this industry. Um, you know, obviously, it's, an, it's our job as, you know, as, as, as the marketers, as the salespeople of the company to be able to convince them that, you know, our services are going to help them get there. Right. That's right. that's really what because there's a lot of different ways that universities can try and improve what they're doing. Um, but that's one of the reasons we, we actually came to this crossroads. And because we started out as a language company. Right. I was very strict for the first four or five years. And I said, we do language translation editing. People would come to us and say, oh, but what about the argument itself? I would say, don't ask us. That's not right. We're like divorced from that until I got so many requests and so many comments. And I started listening. I tried to yeah. listen and people kept on saying, it's a means to an end. But if you're not helping me get to the end, then the means is not valuable to me. And that's why we built out academic coaching. So you can sit with a one-on-one -on -one with a coach to help you through some of your, you know, writer's block or issues like that um, with us. You can get an academic review, which means a scientist in your field is going to come and sort of critique and give feedback. Um, you mentioned before the book proposal, right? So I want to pitch my book to Oxford University Press, you can come to ALE, we'll help you sort of polish, get it into shape. That also has a, has a marketing angle to it, ha help you explain to you who your audience is, how you're going to help them sell it. And then we can make the connection for you to, you know, to the press and, and, and get it out that way. So there are a lot of services that we've kind of built around to support um, the, you know, researcher life cycle that 
just kind of feed off our translation core business and feed back into our translation core business. Because as soon as you help someone, if you write, let's say we work on a book proposal, right? Mm -hmm. If we're just translating, we sort of ignore everything else around it and we're, and it's, it's not great and it gets rejected. So there's no book, right? If we help people on a small scale with their proposal, which is five, six pages, and then all of a sudden it gets accepted, all of a sudden we've won ourselves a full book project, yeah. right? So there, it's sort of like, you know, uh, just lead gen. That's the, uh, you know, you got to help your client get, help your client win you the work, essentially. Exactly. Right. And exactly that's, right. you know, that's not just you. That, that's a lot of different folks out there. Um, I want to, um, you've been doing stuff in, you've published several articles in multilingual. Um, this one's not you, I don't think. Um, yes. Multilingual magazine, that's that's where the connection here is. Academic Translation Considerations is one of the articles back from 2019, going way back. Yeah. And Tear Down This Wall, the Open Access Debate in Life Sciences and How It Affects Translation with Avi Stamen. Yeah. And that one looks like it's in the print edition. That's correct. So any any additional insights you can you know, plug plug that for people that want to go check out your articles in multilingual. For sure. Okay. So so uh, one at a time. Um, so we'll start with the the one about translation or editing. This is sort of a. I'm actually really curious because I find it interesting that there are companies that can get away with just doing translation because. Our, at least in our industry, they can't get away for very constantly. long. Not anymore. Sorry. Not anymore. Like they can get away with it, but they're not growing if they're just doing translation. Got it. Okay. All that's, right. That's, I'm, that's I'm my I'm opinion, and I'm sticking to it. Um, you know, stay out of the comments if you disagree with me. But <laughs> yeah, more. I, I, I said said before, more translation companies should be doing what you're doing. Just stop talking about translation. Start thinking about the all around product. Right? Is because yeah. people don't want translations. They want to win the proposals. Right? People don't exactly. want localization. They want understanding from their yeah. local markets. Right? And those are related but different things. For sure, one hundred percent. So, scholars are constantly most academics, right? They're they they are intelligent um, intelligent beings. Well, most of them, not all of them, but most of them, um, and they've gotten to where they've gotten to probably as a you know most of the time as a result of hard work. One and told. many of them have a certain level of English. However, there is I always inevitably anytime I give a presentation, I always get a question. You know, Avi, is it better to write in my native tongue and and have you translate it, or is it better for me to write in my broken English and have you edit it? And that's a really sort of that's an um, interesting not, question. It's a really interesting question, and I assume that this probably this question is being asked even in corporate settings, you know, sort of all around the world. Like, what what's what's better? What's so? There's a lot of factors, and that's the reason I wrote the article that goes into making that choice, making that decision. It depends on what your level of English is. It depends on what your budget is. It depends on your timing. It depends on whether the language set that you're requesting is you know common or not common. There are a lot of things, and you can kind of check out the article and, and take a look. Um, but what I think is really important is to give yourself that ability to make that decision. And there are scholars who will go back and forth. They'll send us an article for translation one week and then one for editing the next week. And sometimes they'll even like mix it together in the same article, which I don't love, but that happens as well. Um, so really understanding sort of that. That's That was the, the topic of the of the. To me, article. it's just, I mean, the only thing that was making me cringe, like I said, I'm a project manager, is like, this sounds like a nightmare to figure out how to bill for. <laughs> Because yeah, I, I think that's why a lot of LSPs like just selling translation mm -hmm. is because, you know, 500 words, 500 times whatever, right? Yeah. And once we start getting into these more fuzzy, all-inclusive things, it, it becomes a little bit more challenging to, to no put question. SLAs, KPIs, and pricing around. No question. No question. Yeah, we do a per word model, both for translation and editing. So it's not a, you know, there's not a massive difference in the way that we calculated it. But 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 you're right that it's not the same rate per word. So it, it is a pain when we have one text that sort of, you know, uh, um, has a combination has like a mixture within it. Um, you know, that, that that is one of the things that we do by hand currently that I'd love to find a solution for, you know, to automate, but I haven't been happy with the solutions, the automated solutions I found until now. Um, you know, but that's, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's one of the challenges. Um, but most of the time people are writing in one language or another, um, they may switch off from project to project, but within a single project, they're, they're, they're staying consistent. Um, this second article, um, which you're, which you've got up on screen now, tear down this wall, 
um, about open access. And I was thrilled, by the way, to get this article in because I've always looked up to multilingual and always like read the articles. And I was, I was like, oh, these people are way too smart for me to get in there. Um, so when it was when it was uh, accepted, I really um, I, I, I was I was quite, quite happy. Um, yeah, yeah. But so you you are correct in everything that you said. We are very exclusive <laughs> here at multilingual. Nobody yeah, should yeah. ever. <laughs> No, <laughs> we're very accessible. We work with people like, I, no, I, I just need to set the record straight here because I, I want to make sure that there's other people out there. Like we're always looking for good contribution from folks that have something good to say about the industry or about language or about culture at multilingual. We'll work with you. We'll come to you. We understand we're an English publication or they're, they are an English. I don't take credit for what they do over there. Um, they're an English publication at multilingual. Um, but we also understand that our audience is majority non non native English speakers, so we we try to come to you on your level. And if if there's a, something that you want to say over at Multilingual, um, then please reach out reach out to to us over there, and don't be intimidated. All right, sorry, thanks for the plug. No, no, Any good. It's always good. To, 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 I I love everything you said there. Um, the Okay, so I'm not going to get. We, I actually give a, a one hour um, uh, workshop on or two hour workshop on open access and what it means for for scholars. I'm not going to bore you with all the nitty gritty. But what I will say is is that there is a movement uh, to make as much scholarship available to anyone who wants um, a, a, to the greatest extent possible. Um, until now, or until a few years ago, if you if you Tucker as it was you know the head of a research institute, but is not affiliated, I, my guess, with a university or college uh, in an official way, you would have to pay up to $150, $200 if you wanted to read an academic article online, which, you know, you may say, well, I never would want to do that. But there may be times where there are, you know, God forbid someone in your family gets sick and you want to you want to really understand what is going on here. What are the solutions? Oh, what are the possibilities? I work I work at Nimsy Insights. Like there's been so many times when I'm trying to find something. I'm like, oh, look, there's a great article. Bam, paywall. I'm like, okay. paywall. And then I'm like, all right, well, I'll pay for it. And then I click on I'm like, no, I'm not going to pay for it. That's way too much. I'm sorry. I'm not going to pay for something like that, that I don't even know if it's going to contain the information that I need. Exactly. Exactly. Brilliant. So that's, that's, so the open access movement has basically come along to say enough of that, right? Okay. We're not, we're not, we're, we're, we're no, we're, you know, tear down the, the, the paywall and make and make um, scholarship accessible to anyone and everyone who wants it. Um, it's created a whole new slew of problems, but we won't get into that um, um, this evening. But essentially, part of the concept of making research open and making things avail readily available is also thinking about language. Um, because when you're only publishing exclusively in English, you're excluding a big swath of the you know of the world um, that could benefit from it. There's also you know, financial incentives to do it. You know, I mean, China is a big enough, uh, uh, you know, market um, to, to justify a lot of translation, which isn't currently happening. Um, so this, if I remember correctly, this was a special issue dealing with life sciences. So I kind of wanted to dive into the life sciences, which is, I would say 95% in English. Um, it really is not, you know, doesn't spread out well at all and try and think a little bit about, um, you know, how do we open up this research both with taking down paywalls, but also with making it more accessible through multilingualism and helping, um, you know, scholars in different places uh, to be able to access it, or maybe not scholars. Um, you know, maybe you have uh, uh, lay professionals or industry professionals. So you've got the right. Let's take let's take the field of education for example, right? So a lot of education scholars are publishing the research, and it has direct impact on students, on parents, on teachers. But the students, parents, and teachers are not going to go in and you know, read an article on some, you know, journal website. So you need mm. to figure out how to, and in a language that's not their first language, so you need to figure out how to bring, bring things down to earth. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I bring this example a lot, but you know, the pandemic really showed us this. We sucked at communicating research that when it comes down to it, we just, you know, as a scientific community, we, Bell on our face. You're singing my song. I mean, you are singing my song. This is why <laughs> Nimsy Insights exists because we have – so Nimsy Insights started with a book. I don't know. There's probably one behind me called The General Theory of the Translation Company. I wrote it with my business partner. And it's written like – I mean 
it borderlines graphic novel or comic book. Like it's not written at a high level. It's supposed to be easy to read, easy to digest, easy to understand, funny, entertaining. There, there literally are comic strips in there, right? And that, um, that was received very successfully, and we ended up starting a business together. Kind of, but always with this same principle of it doesn't matter how smart or how world changing your research is. If nobody reads it because it's boring or because it's inaccessibly long or because it's written at a Ph.D. level in English and most of your audience is not a native English speaker, then who cares? Who cares? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So here at NIMSY Insights, we focus now our reports are getting longer and longer, the, the more complex projects we work on. But we've always tried to prioritize this, you know, short reports, executive summaries, bullet points, infographics, 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 right? Multimedia delivery methods, right? Not everybody learns in the same way. Some people like to some people like to read long reports. All right, here, fine. Here's a long report. Some people like to look at an infographic. Sure, here's an infographic giving you you, in theory, the same information from that report. Some people like to listen to a podcast um, while they're doing the dishes. Ding, 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 Nimsy Live, right? So we'll have like a report, an infographic, an e-learning module, uh, a live stream, a podcast, all on the same subject. Because our, our whole thing here at Nimsy Insights, is, uh, I'm not trying to turn this into an infomercial, but I mean, it's, you can tell I feel passionately about this, is that um, we need to come to you where you're at, right? And this is, this is what the information age has brought us. This is what the World Wide Web has brought us, is that the onus is upon the content providers to come to the, the consumers of the content in a, in a way, in a method, in a medium in which they feel comfortable. Previously, it was like consumers, well, shoot, you're the ones that want information, um, so you need to do the work. You need to, you need to come to us. We're going to publish you know, in this format. You either like it or you don't, essentially. Yeah. So. yeah. And, 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 and to drive this home uh, you know, in my industry – you know, academics can be the worst when it comes to, you know, sort of their sitting up in the ivory tower and, you know, kind of we we have the truth and the knowledge here um, and either we don't have the time or we don't have the energy. And then I know I'm throwing everyone kind of in the same boat. There are a, a lot of wonderful and tremendous academics out there who do who do wonderful work at making um, research more accessible. But, you know, for example, I was invited about a year ago to take over of the scholarly communication podcast. And I immediately said yes, because I really feel like this is, you know, this is what is needed. If we want people to trust, you know, in general, um, you know, authority is kind of under attack um, in all sorts of ways. And in some ways, that's probably a good thing. In some ways, that's, you know, uh, but so, in some ways, it's probably not. We're, we're um, starting I, to go down not, a whole different yeah, road I mean, here. So I'm let's be careful. Political, okay. uh, yeah, I'm not getting political here. But I will say that I personally was was quite surprised by the lack of trust in, you know, sort of scientific results that came out um, over the course of the pandemic. Right. Meaning I just sort of grew up in this, I guess, um, you know, bubble where it was like, OK, if researchers say it, then it must be true. And I actually don't think that's a good thing either. I think that research should be critiqued um, and, 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 and analyzed as well. Um, but in order to but I think that the major, you know, sort of. Um, gap here is, uh, uh, you know, a lack of understanding or internalization or willpower to be able to say, okay, we have discovered something important. Now let's make the effort to communicate that in the way that it's necessary. And actually we just, our, our newest services, um, if you don't mind me to, to plug for, for 20 seconds, our newest services that we rolled out about four or five months ago are a series of what are called post-publication services. So these are services that don't, we've been talking this whole time about how do you get your research published? What we're doing now is saying, okay, great. It's wonderful. You got it, you know, published in the journal of your dreams. Now, now that you've done that, now that you have that sort of rubber stamp of approval and the veracity of what you're doing now, take it. And how do you turn it into something tangible and something um, that, that people can use? So that's something, if you scroll down to the bottom of this page, uh, Tucker, there's a link to the post publication, check out our, we, we call them publication impact services. Ah, it's like, how do you take what you've done and make impact? So 
You can do a layman's report. That's a report, that, a one pager that anyone in the world can read and understand and say, oh, I get what you're doing. Now, I've had I've had universities turn to us and say our donor just, you know, they they forked over, you know, five million dollars for a project. They don't know what the hell they're supporting because it's too complicated. Can you explain it to them? Right. Or we have executive summaries that we're doing. Um, so if you want to kind of take what you're doing and present it to politicians or present it to decision makers, you, you could take we're trying to distill the research and turn it into something very practical. Um, if you scroll down, you can see there's some other ones. So, you know, you can take, for example, um, a press release. So you, we can help in a news article. We can help you take your research and turn it into something which could make it to CNN or Fox News or, you know, BBC and actually make a difference and make an impact. I mean, you'd be surprised the same way that, you know, you said, Tucker, before I, you're looking that, for good that, content. That's one of my, like, goal KPIs for Nimsy Insights is, you know, like Renato, my founder or my co-founder and I, we're, we're, when, when we talk, we talk like, why, why is CNN <laughs> not interviewing experts from Nimsy Insights? Why is blah, 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 blah. And we yeah. know because there's a whole ecosystem out there that we don't understand, blah, 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 blah. But um, yeah, maybe we need to give you a call. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, meaning I think that, that there is something to, you know, to, to thinking beyond your, you know, direct industry. You know, I think we, we're, there's so much to do within our own industries that it right. can be hard sometimes to kind of that, branch out. And that's think that's a big part of you. You nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. That's a big part of our struggle here at NMC Insights is that we're, we're experts on our industry, language services, and that's great. Um, and, you know, I think we are good experts, but the, the weakness that that brings is that it, it it's hard to see what's relevant to normals, you know, normal people, normies out there, people that don't care, people that don't know what a TMS or an LSP or neural machine translation is right those are the people that are making decisions on who to who to call to be interviewed by i don't even know people's names i don't watch the news anymore on on cnn uh yeah i'm not i'm definitely not in a position to give you advice my my sort of anecdotal experience um or impression um, i've seen some articles in the new york times i've seen some articles you know that deal with translation they generally are on individual stories. And I, I guess that's not a big, you know, I'm not saying anything too groundbreaking, but it's less, let's think about the industry and the impact it's making. And it's more, let's talk about one project that, you know, like you yeah. said, sometimes it's because the project went wrong and something embarrassing, but there can also be a project where something goes really right. Um, or taking up, for example, one of the topics I've seen covered actually, uh, you know, a little bit more recently is, you know, the, 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 the anonymity of the translator and to what extent should we be recognizing their work versus having them in the background. And these are topics where I think there's an emotive oh, so element to it. We remember Amanda Gorman, right? The, yeah. you know, and be, with the, the inclusion, diversity, I don't even know how to talk about it anymore, but, you know, can white translators be translating black written black authored content, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. So it's, um, yeah, it's in the news. It's in the news, but Hey, we're, right. I, I'm looking at the clock here and I've, I've actually got a run here pretty soon. So we're running out of time. Any, any last plugs, any, well, I, here's, here's what I want to do. I want to go over to chat and say hi to everybody in chat because we've got Pedro Lawson, William, um, Pedro again, Stefan. Um, I know I saw Adi in there somewhere. There she is, Adi from Accra. Um, thanks for hanging in there with us today, guys. I think my mom's even watching. Hi, mom. I sent you a link. So i got to give my mom a plug. Conrado M. Ramirez Sordo. Welcome from Mexico City. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We're going to be doing more of these um, as, we go, as we go live a little bit more. But Avi, I'm going to give you the, the closing word here if there's any last minute things that we didn't cover. Well, you, you mentioned your mom, so I'll give my mom a shout out, especially since um, she is uh, uh, born and raised in Seattle. So I, I you know, make the connection there to uh, make the connection there to you, Tucker. Um, I will um, I'll invite anyone who wants uh, is welcome to reach out to me. LinkedIn is a great way to, to connect. Um, I'm pretty active there. Um, and whether it's, you know, you know, you're an individual, um, scholar who, you know, found this interesting or even, you know, industry, you know, you might be maybe in a, in a, in a, you know, with a company where you have access to research, but you might not know how to deliver, um, you know, those sort of deliverables that we have. 
Um, I think that's one way for potential expansion um, in the future is to kind of team up with other LSPs to help them sort of add at this as an offering to their current service. Um, we haven't been doing too much of that till now, but I think that's definitely a way that we can help because I think that this is sort of a, a really nice complement to maybe some of the some of the work that's being done out there, especially in the medical uh, and, and and legal fields. Um, so definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, happy to set up a time to chat with anyone who's interested. Um, Tucker, this has been a, you know, check out our website, um, www.acklang.com. Um, and Tucker, this has been a really phenomenal opportunity. Um, I really enjoy chatting with you. Uh, it's been fun. You know, and, yeah, um, we should do this again soon. And, for sure. uh, and thanks for all the wonderful stuff you do at NIMSY because I, I, you know, I'm a big fan and I am constantly, you know, uh, looking at the reports and, 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 uh, sorry about and the paywall. Well. Yeah, exactly. Sorry about there the you paywall. Are. So. <laughs> bringing that back home so well thank you so much avi i'm gonna take us out here uh ladies gentlemen uh chat everybody in chat that we just said hi to we are out of time today so if you enjoyed this nimsy live experience then join us next time on tomorrow i think i'm talking to tim brooks from the endangered alphabet project which is which is super cool. You need to come check that out. If, you, if you're not familiar with the Endangered Alphabet Project, then you need to go familiar. Google it now. Don't wait until tomorrow. So once again, my name is Tucker Johnson, and it has been my pleasure to join you, to lead you on this live stream today. I appreciate our guest today, Avi Stamen. Uh, I appreciate everybody in chat. I appreciate all of the hard, hardworking researchers here at NIMSY Insights that are publishing research on the language services industry. And... I look forward to seeing you all next time. And with that, we're going to test my new outro. Let's see if it works. <laughs>